Fala, meu povo! Literalmente. Hoje eu vou conversar com o elenco de The Umbrella Academy, parte do elenco, e com o showrunner Steve Blackman. E a gente conversou sobre a segunda temporada, a catarse que todos os personagens passaram, as grandes dificuldades, os grandes desafios de trazer esses personagens tão complexos e tão cheios de camada para a vida. Eu sei que essa entrevista está sendo aguardada por vocês desde a estreia da segunda temporada, mas eu sempre digo que a gente tarda, mas não falha. Cá está meu papo com Klaus, Ben, número 5, Diego e Steve para vocês. Espero que vocês curtam, compartilhem com os seus amigos que amam The Umbrella Academy e já comenta aí se você curtiu. Se você quer mais, vai que a gente consegue mais algum papo com alguém incrível para vocês também. Curte aí o vídeo. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hi. First of all, it's a pleasure to talk with both of you. Thanks for the Umbrella family. Brazilian fans just love you guys. Thanks, love. I want to start talking about the challenges of your characters in this season. In the season two, we see the family growing apart and creating their own lives in the 60s, except number five, of course, except Ben is following clubs. <laughs> But still with the apocalypse story, what's the biggest challenge for our characters in this season? Well, I have the same challenge as last season, but the approach is a lot different because obviously he's saving or at least trying to uh, save the world again. But the stakes are a lot higher because a lot more can go wrong since they're back in the 60s. So the timeline could get uh, way more damaged than it could in season one because 2019 apocalypse, they still haven't solved that yet. So if you add two, then it unravels it. And then it was also before their birth. So it gets into a bunch of different time paradoxes. So when I'm preparing for a scene, I have to keep all of that in mind and going through the logistics of solving that very complex problem. For five, it's incredibly stressful. So that's his biggest challenge is managing all of that. But his approach is different in that he's a lot more accepting of his family. He wants their help in season two. I suppose to find for Klaus is to find a replacement for drugs because I think the uh, the, the falling in love with Dave sort of put an end to the self-destruction of drugs because he found a reason to live. But now that he has a reason to live, he had to kind of find some other way, some, some other anesthetic, you know. I think um, being sort of showered with love and praise and all that stuff was was sort of, sort of Klaus's unconscious way of replacing drugs. So I suppose his biggest challenge, the challenge last year, was to kind of stop being such a nitwit and um, figure out what's making him so restless and so sad. Uh, for Ben, I think it's just learning to find a bit more independence. Klaus and Ben have been together for three years at the start of the season, and they think that their other siblings have unfortunately passed away or perished. So I think at this point, Ben is sort of reaching his limit um, and his patience is really being tested. So I think that's one of the biggest obstacles is how do you separate yourself or gain some agency when you know, you're tied to someone's powers or abilities? So we'll see some of that this season. What the hell is that? The end of the world, November 25th, 1963. All right, first off, I want to say we brought the end of the world back here with us. Oh my God, again? My cult is going to be so pissed. I told him we had until 2019. We have until Monday. Hi, Steve. It's a pleasure Hi. to You. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you too. How are you? Fine. Better now. <laughs> <laughs> Umbrella Academy is an action comic story about a family that happens to be superheroes. But we see a lot of drama, a lot of real problems, especially about mental health. What is it like to mix all these teams to make a show so important and so fun to all of us? Good question. Um, the most important thing for me, obviously, is to make it relatable and real. We have a wonderful heightened element with the superheroes. But, you know, for me, the most important thing is sort of telling the character stories, uh, making them feel real so people can relate to it. I mean, these are not perfect characters. They have 
big problems. They're struggling with each other. They're struggling with their dad. And I think that's what makes it uh, fun to watch is because you you understand, you, you see in those characters, people that you know, people that you love in your family. I think if we got too big and too heightened, you, you would lose that relationship with these characters. So at the start, I always want the characters to feel real. And then the fun is adding the action and the heightened superhero stuff later. Is there any character that you identify with the most yourself? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I actually, I feel I, I know a little bit of all of them. I, I don't think there's one character that I feel completely disconnected from. I, you know, I love their vulnerabilities, you know, with my own vulnerabilities, the struggles I feel I can relate to. But there's no one character I feel any more relatable to, you know, but I, I see a little bit of me in all of them and I, I can see my family and friends in all of them, right? In the first part of this story, Diego and number five are together looking for help for their own father, who we know it's not a good father at all for both of you and for all the family. As mental health is a strong theme in this story, is this season a kind of a catharsis for the characters, for all the characters? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone is kind of living out a life. Uh, based on the trauma that dad had uh, kind of instilled in all of us. And obviously, you know, everyone can speak on themselves, but if, if you watch the show, you kind of see just even as small as Luther having a relationship with like Jack Ruby, you know, and, and Diego obviously doing what he only knows what to do, which is stop crime. I would say that Five, his, his relationship to Hargreaves is... It's a lot of self-resentment as he went into the later stages of his life, but he grew up just hating Hargreaves. The I told you so followed him around for years, knowing, because he couldn't get out of the apocalypse. He was stuck there, and Reginald gave him every warning. There's a lot of hatred that way, but he began to understand where Hargreaves was coming from. The writers were asking me about this because Five only spent time with Hargreaves when he was 13, and he was a very different character at that point. So they asked me, like, what would the dynamic between those two be like? Because they were writing the scene for the two of them. I thought probably one of resentment, but understanding. And when we actually got to do that scene with Colin, it was very touching for me to come full circle with that character and gain Hargreaves' forgiveness. So I thought that was a really sweet moment between those two characters yeah do you think this is a season of catharsis for the umbrella family yes i do they reach definitely some form of catharsis you know by the end of it I mean, it's catharsis, and yet it's also creating even more problems. So there's a bit of catharsis, but there's also a bit of revisiting old demons that continue to come up again and again for this family. None of us are supposed to be here, right? We know something changes the timeline. We have to make it right again. Before everyone and everything we know is dead. For the comic book fans, this is a delightful show because there is so many Easter eggs, so many dialogues that make us scream and applaud. Mm -hmm. So what is it like to recreate this comic book vibe on the TV show? The best thing, I, it makes me happy to know that the graphic novel fans love it. I wanted to respect the source material from Gerard and Gabriel. I didn't want to go in and make the fans think this is a terrible show. So mm -hmm. I wanted to stay enough in that world that the graphic novel fans really really loved it, but bring in a whole new audience. The comic book is so inventive that uh, it's, tr it's tricky to adapt it, but I have a great relationship with both of them. And, you know, early on, they're like, you know, find your version of this. Uh, we, have the, we have the graphic novel, we have the TV show, and they can both exist, you know, they don't have to be carbon copies of each other. In season two, we can see this dysfunctional family going deeper in their feelings and reinventing themselves. Was there any challenge in this process? Yeah, it is because, you know, the hard part for us writing the show is to continually to find other layers of these people and the characters. So it still feels fresh to the audience and you get to sort of peel another layer of the onion. At the same time, it's easy to go too deep and get too dramatic and uh, to a point where it becomes more of a soap opera than a TV show, a drama. So There's a balance and, you know, we work very hard to find that balance, you know, and I, and I hope we achieved it. Do you have a favorite scene? in season two? That's a hard question. There's so many scenes I love. I really like the fight in the Mexican consulate in episode four. The camera that stays outside the hallway the entire time and just 
pans along. We get to just see snapshots of the fight with Diego, one of the Swedes. That's one of my favorite shots. Uh, I love all the scenes with um, Ellen, with Vanya and Sissy. I love those scenes. I think they're really emotional. I really love it all. I mean, I, I, it's hard to choose. Do you have a favorite moment between Klaus and Ben? You know, uh, we were talking about this yesterday. There's a lovely moment of physical acting meets visual effects where Ben has successfully possessed Klaus and uh, Klaus is trying to is trying to force Ben out of his body. And Ben is trying to run both of them to, to meet the other siblings down the alleyway. So there's this lovely piece of uh, Klaus Ben quarreling in the same body that happens in episode seven, I think, which I found really funny. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, so in order to shoot that scene, you know, they had Robbie sort of running down the alleyway, twisting and turning and grabbing what he imagined to be me coming out of him and then coming back in. And, and, then, uh, and then I shot it sort of mirroring what he had done so that they could sort of combine the two and create that, that possession sequence. So it was a lot of fun, obviously incredibly technical and, and difficult, yeah. but... I think, as, as Robbie said, the end product is great. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Grace. Bye. Thank you. Nice Bye-bye. meeting you. Bye-bye. Nice meeting you. <laughs> Klaus, it's Ben here. No, unfortunately, ghosts can't time travel. Are you kidding me?